So cannabis started having me experience what my twin was experiencing. And it took me a little bit though to realize that he was having me experience my twin's real experience. My twin's experience that was going on in more of his subconscious mind. In essence, cannabis was having me directly interact with my twin's shadow. My twin, of course, denies this. And I was really confused at first because I was trying to ask him questions about what was going on because I would... My, and my emotions became very heavily... Oh, I would say chained to my twin. And I could not understand it. I still don't particularly understand it. I mean, there is that intensity of the twin flame thing. But after, you know, what Mel in Golden Ray Twin Flames talks about the bubble love phase and it dropped. Um, I could not forget about him. Every time I tried to gain a little bit of clarity, some distance to regather my thoughts, because I started feeling an alarm happening in me that I was no longer paying attention to my shamanic path. I was no longer paying attention to other people that needed me. It was almost as if I was being consumed. And I'm going to just say I was stupid, but I allowed it to happen because I wanted that initial love back. And I didn't realize, I can't, I, I can't get into this right now. I guess this is not what I'm supposed to talk about. <laughs> There's, there is very deep pain here. But I've realized that I, he trapped me. That doesn't sound very much like the twin. And that sounds a lot more like the projection of the shadow. And in essence, I had repeated insights that he was, you know, an incubus. But I also had insights that I was succubus or um, a siren. It, it, something was going on with cannabis to try to get me to understand these vampiric, because vampire was part of it. But they're all vampiric energies. They're all energies that feed off of the energy of someone else. So I think this was ultimately Cannabis's lesson. He was trying to get me to understand vampiric energy. And being removed from my paradise Falling deeper into despair, losing my hope in humanity. My heart is, at this point, really murdering me. Just dashing all of my illusions about any goodness that I thought existed in humanity. And is telling me, I'm telling myself rather, that there's no hope in living. So, to teach me a lesson, I'm not entirely certain, 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 <laughs> what cannabis was, the extent of what cannabis was trying to teach me, except for it's coming up today again for my review in relationship to Amanita. So now I believe there's actually a twin flame energy happening between these two. 
And so what he was trying to show me by having my twin do it was to trap me. And I had to get out. I don't think I'm not going to be arrogant enough to say that all twin relationships are relationships of soul entrapment. But I will say that people who are driven by their shadow, people who refuse to admit what they've done or what they do to other people, they refuse to admit their pain, they just live in their shadow. And you know, honestly, this is everybody. This has nothing to do with the twin flame dynamic. This is everybody. And people in this highly unconscious state don't realize that they're actually master magicians and that they're practicing black magic. And I think that was the lesson for me with all of this, was to see how people practice their, this black magic. And they do it through projections. Projection is this idea of um, not wanting to admit what is part of the self, but saying that this is part of the other person. So in essence, it's becoming the victim and everybody else is the abuser. My series of books, I called myself the reluctant narcissist because I decided to embody this energy because everyone says, you know, I was wrong. I'm the narcissist. And they're the innocent victims. Of course, so in my shadow work, I go deep into that. Well, what have I done? And I reached a point, finally, after I got back from paradise, I reached a point where I could no longer blame myself. I could no longer give everyone else the proverbial get-out-of-jail-free card. And I finally had to admit how ugly people are. I finally had to admit the destruction of their shadows. How much black magic people create. And I finally realized the black magic my twin kept throwing at me. And I didn't know what to do with time. It was just recognizing the black magic. And it's only today that I actually started realizing what this awareness was for. So this is where Amanita comes back into the picture. Because as I was finishing up my books a couple of weeks ago, at least the main story, I hope, it seems like every time I think I'm about to finish that there's more that needs to come out. And so I have like book one edited and almost ready for publication. But books two through nine <laughs> are nowhere near publication ready. And book one might need to be completely revised. So anyways, toward the end of book nine, this is where I see the drama playing out between my inner child, Pilly, and my higher self, Pally. And up to this point, I had always called my inner child, Pilly Pally. And at this point, I, and also, I never referred to myself as Papillion. I kept referring to myself as Pally. That it was Pally that went through this whole dark night of the soul. It was Pally that had all these experiences. Because in essence, it was. It was Pally at some point, maybe it was going to church or something catalyzed it. But I had done enough with whatever I was doing in my life that my higher self decided to join with me. I saw, I see this as a dissension into me. And when that happened, 
in my books, and I, I was consciously aware of this vaguely, of the whole need to change, because I had almost my life referred to part of myself as Papillion. I always identified with this large butterfly that was named Papillion. And in lots of things like um, screen names and whatever, I would always call myself Papillion. And right about the time of the parade, when I had to start processing this stuff afterward and I opened up to spirit world communication, I had this strong need to change my name to Pally. At the time, not knowing that this was my higher self. So in my series of books, it's about Pally. Because it's about this journey after this fall. It's about this journey through the shadow, valley of the shadow of death. But, about Easter, that changed. I went back, and this time now I understand a lot more of what happened. I went back to calling myself Papillion. And this was my ego self. My heart, in essence, is Papillion. But I still called my inner child Pilly Pally. Shortly after that, she wanted me to drop the Pally, and now she just wants to be Pilly. And so I finally reached this point within the last few weeks of there is now three distinct parts. There is Pally, there is Papillion, and there is Pilly. And it is Pilly and Papillion that are working together now. And in my books, Pilly and Pally had this altercation. See, this is the interesting thing about my books, is they're allowing me to glimpse what's going on subconsciously. Because I'm not always conscious of what's going on. I'll see these certain things happening. Like I said, when I met my twin, I didn't understand what was going on. In my books, it talked about this whole experience that we had had together. Physically, though, I did see different things. Physically, I was aware that I needed to change my name to Pilly. Consciously, unconsciously though, I didn't realize it was Samba that had planted that idea and asked me to change my name. So I got to see this exchange happening between Pilly and Pally. And in this moment, or pre, toward, I mean, even book nine, you really start to see this bifurcation of Pally and Papillion. And there is more identification of Papillion coming into herself, being herself and saying, this is who I am. I don't have to keep saying that I'm somehow inferior because I am who I am. I don't have to say that I need to be Pally. So in this particular scene, Pally has finally had it. I don't know, remember what happened exactly, but she ended up kind of having a fit, a big fit, to where she's like stomping. And she ends up breaking something. She's expecting there to be like hard rock under her and all of a sudden there's not hard rock. So she's falling and she keeps falling and for about the third time in the series of books, I end up visiting this cave of what I call a giant Amanita forest. And at this point, Pilly is bouncing around like a, a pinball. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> and at one point, she finally gets stuck on one of the Amanita mushrooms. And Mary Magdalene then comes in and says, oh Amanita, you're true to your name. You really are a flycatcher. <laughs> I don't quite understand it, but one of the names for the Amanita mushroom is fly agric. 
I'm probably mispronouncing it, but uh, it has to do with its ability to kill flies, I think, or catch them or something. I don't know. So, Pally wants to get off of this. And Mary Magdalene is starting to get upset. She says, okay, Amanita, you can let go. Okay, Amanita, you can let go. And Amanita won't let go. She's like, since when have you stopped listening to me and obeying my commands? You're, you've always been a partner with me. You've always done the things I've asked you to do as you assist me in waking up humanity. So what happened? Why are you now not partnering with me? Then this laugh sounds and Papillion, or I'm sorry, Pally turns pale. She knows this voice. And so she then says, Pilly? Is that you? And so there's this altercation that ends up occurring between Pilly and Papillion. And it results, I mean, what, after she, Pally recognizes that this is Pilly, Pally forcefully tears herself away from the Amanita mushroom and ends up stomping out, turning around though and confronting Pilly saying, how dare you? We are supposed to be supporting Papillion. She has all this turmoil going on in her life. She thinks that she's pregnant. We are supposed to be supporting her. And yet here you are acting like a childish spoiled brat. And Pilly says, I've had it. I'm leaving. So she's leaving and she's charged with all this energy. Ends up shocking everything. She's trying to find her way out of this cave labyrinth. And Pilly now is following behind her. And Pilly is stopping. Because there's all these unfortunate animals that got in the way of Pally's tirade. Pally's very unconscious tirade. She's just spouting off. She's just throwing this fit. And Pilly is going behind. And at first it was just these tiny little shocks. And she would heal these animals. And they would go on their way. Gra gradually the shocks are getting more and more intense. And finally Pilly reaches one that's dead. And she looks at Mary and says, Mother, there's nothing I could do about this. I don't know how to heal death. And so Mary shows her how to heal death. And Pilly, with tears in her eyes, looks at Mary and says, But we've got to stop Pally. She is going to kill all of these creatures just because she's pissed off. We've got to stop her. So... This is essentially where the books ended, okay? And these videos now are picking up where that ended. Because what needs to happen is I need to make this conscious connection between all of these different events, between these different parts of myself. And just today, I realized now it's time to figure out what is this Amanita mushroom? What's she trying to tell me? What is Mary doing in all this? Actually, Mary has been a part of me for quite some time. But is this talking about my ability to heal? My ability to restore life? Or what? So this is 19 minutes. <laughs> yeah. I'll talk to you in a bit. Bye.